So we're looking at the cardiovascular system this week, one of the most important body systems. Um, we can associate the cardiovascular system with overall um, health of the human body, right? So the cardiovascular system is really important as it applies to oxygenation and circulation. And so we can imagine that the changes here are going to be very impactful on overall uh, health. Um, so the All right, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, we should be able to describe aging changes that are evident on the structures in the cardiovascular system. So that's the heart itself and the vasculature. We should also be able to describe some of the functional effects that are brought about as a result of those changes. And then talk about some of the interventions uh, associated with maintaining good heart health. So let's kind of start out by revising some of the anatomy of the cardiovascular system. Um, so it consists of, as we mentioned earlier, the heart, which is the pump. Essentially, it's got two atria, two ventricles, as well as the blood vessels, um, so including arteries and veins, and then the actual blood that is being circulated. So these are the components of the cardiovascular system. Um, we can also talk about the main functions that are brought about by the system. So there's transportation of nutrients, oxygens, oxygen, hormones, um, as well as the removal of byproducts, so waste products such as nitrogenous waste um, and other byproducts from metabolic processes. This system also helps with the immune function because it provides the, the, um, the circulatory component, which is the blood, for the circulation of white blood cells, antibodies, um, even phagocytes such as neutrophils and macrophages. And so it's going to help in the protection of the body by being able to circulate those cells to sites of inflammation or infection. Um, it's also going to regulate body temperature, um, pH, the uh, osmolarity of our cells, so the amount of water um, in our cells, as well as circulate other important molecules like proteins that help with blood clotting. And this will obviously be important in wound healing and tissue injuries. So these are just some of the many functions that are associated with the cardiovascular system. And we can see how, although it's a system in and of itself, it's really lending itself to all of the body systems, because, especially because of the, the function of transporting, transporting excuse me, nutrients and oxygen to the other body systems that need um, those, that need that. The heart uh, itself also acts as a pump to circulate blood throughout the body. And so this is what is used to circulate some of the other molecules and components that we talked about, such as um, immune cells and hormones. Now we've got this idea and I've, I keep mentioning that the cardiovascular system and its association with aging is so important. It's one of the most important body systems. So let's talk about why the CVS is so important um, as, it, as it pertains to aging. So the prevalence of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular dysfunction is highest among elderly population. So that's individuals over 60, over 65. Um, there's also a rapid growth globally in the number of elderly patients that have some type of cardiovascular dysfunction that eventually leads to their mortality. Um, most of the deaths that are associated with chronic heart conditions are going to be in patients, again, in that elderly population above the age of 65. And again, a large chunk, 60% of the hospitalizations are going to also be in this aging, um, in this age bracket. And we also see that the number of individuals that are living above 65 is also rapidly growing. So that will also um, show us that the fast rate, fast growing rate of the elderly population is just going to uh, augment the amount of chronic disease, especially in the cardiovascular system that we see in this, um, this demographic. And so there's going to be an increase in demand in care for elderly patients, particularly with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular dysfunction. And so we can see here, when we look at the risk for coronary artery disease, so that's plaque formation um, seen within the arteries, the risk of that increases steadily and progressively with age. 
Um, and we can kind of compare the risk, um, let's say in the uh, age range 30 to 39, it's quite minimal, even more so for women. Um, and then by the time we get into the 50s and 60s, that risk has, um, has increased exponentially. And we can also appreciate that while there's a gap in this risk for men and women, both uh, men and women are seeing an increase in their risk. Now let's talk about some of the structural changes that we can appreciate to the cardiovascular structures with age. Um, and I kind of want to reiterate this idea that we're delineating this from actual pathology. So from injury, um, we're, we're delineating this from malignancy, from actual um, pathology. And so this is the kind of change that we would see traditionally with age in the heart and the uh, vasculature. So we see increased thickness of the walls of arteries. This includes this calcification um, of the valves, which causes stiffening of the valves and then this dilation of the chamber itself. Um, so because we've got this thickened chamber, um, the volume for filling has decreased and the heart has to work even harder to compensate the uh, thickening of the arteries as well as the stiffening and calcification of the valves. We see a decrease uh, responsiveness of our adrenergic receptors and baroreceptors to things like um, postural change. And so whereas the um, autonomic nervous system would kick in and um, adjust for postural changes, adjust blood pressure for postural changes, we see a blunting of that response as a part of age. This leads to dizziness and lightheadedness with a change in posture that's sometimes experienced with uh, older individuals. There's an impaired functioning of the SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart. And so we see a decrease in the number of these cells, which leads to an impaired weight and rhythm in the heart. Um, there's also an impaired functioning of the blood vessels, tying back to this increased thickening in the wall of the blood vessels. Um, and sometimes there are uh, plaque formation changes and inflammatory changes that are associated with vessels as well. This is what leads to the narrowing of the lumen of vessels. We see an increase in the systemic arterial blood pressure, which is really caused because of the decreased elasticity of large arteries, such as the aorta. And when they lose their elasticity, they become more stiff. And so we see these higher systolic, uh, higher systemic blood pressures, which also lead to this thickening of the ventricular wall as the chamber has to work harder to compensate against these stiff vessels and this high um, systemic pressure. We also see atherosclerosis, which I kind of mentioned earlier. So this widespread um, plaque deposition in arteries, particularly smaller arteries, such as the coronary arteries that supply the heart or arteries that supply the brain. This can lead to heart attacks and strokes as a result. Um, and then another interesting, more histological change that we see is the deposition of lipofusin. So lipofusin is a brown pigment, which is usually deposited in multiple organs as a part of aging. We see it in the brain, we see it in the liver, we even see it in the retina, parts of the eye. Um, and we definitely see it in the heart muscle. It usually aggregates around the nucleus and is uh, sometimes referred to as the aging pigment because it's just usually seen, usually associated with aging um, organs and particularly aging muscle. Um, and so we want to point out here as well that the veins don't usually have um, enough of a change structurally to impede normal functioning, even though they are associated with valves, the way that we see this, the valves stiffen in the heart, we don't actually see enough of a valvular change or change to the vein, the walls of the vein that would impede the, um, the more passive process of veins in general. Let's talk a little bit about atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is the gradual hardening and narrowing of our vasculatures, particularly the walls of arteries, which blocks these arteries and affects the perfusion, the ability of um, these organs to receive adequate nutrient and oxygens, oxygen. And so this is usually brought about by inflammation and damage to the endothelium, which is the underlying uh, 
layer of the blood vessel. And so when this type of damage occurs, there's usually aggregation of other cells um, that try to compensate for that vascular injury. And so there's this aggregation and plaque formation, which eventually narrows the lumen of the vessel and creates blockages that sometimes will even completely impede blood flow and circulation. Um, it's usually as a result of injury that's created by lifestyle risk factors, such as high blood pressures, smoking, alcohol, cholesterol in the diet. And so these types of um, inflammatory mediators, is what we can call them, create this type of injury. And the process of the um, immune system trying to compensate for that injury is what leads to the formation of a plaque at that, at that site. And so it eventually aggregates and forms and grows over time until it can completely impede perfusion. This is where we get our strokes, heart attacks, um, and just general vascular disease that is associated with this type of vascular change. Here we can appreciate kind of an overview of some of the general age-associated changes of the heart um, and the vasculature. So again, dilation of the large arteries, but remember here that although the artery is getting larger, um, the lumen is getting smaller because of that endothelial dysfunction, which leads to the plaque formation. We also see thickening of the tunica intima. This is called the intima layer. It's one of the middle layers of the vessel, which is really created by smooth muscle. And so as we see hypertrophy of that smooth muscle, we then see this thickening of the vascular wall, um, which culminates with this blockage. Um, we see impaired contractility of the heart muscle itself. Uh, we see abnormal weight and rhythm, again, because of the loss of the SA nodal cells. We see that left ventricular hypertrophy that I talked about as a result of higher systolic pressures and um, calcified stiff vessels, calcified stiff valves as well. And then we see, because of this thickening heart muscle, this uh, hypertrophy of the left ventricle, we then see what's called diastolic dysfunction, where the heart does not uh, fill as adequately because the volume for filling is diminished because it's kind of taken over by the thicker ventricular muscle. So the heart doesn't fill as well, it doesn't relax as well, and as a result there's insufficiency because if you can't fill well, um, you can't pump blood out well, right? So there's that diastolic dysfunction which is a result of the left ventricular hypertrophy. So let's kind of talk about some of the consequences of the changes that we talked about earlier. So as a result of all of those structural changes to the heart wall, the chamber size, the valves, and the vessel wall, these are some of the consequences that we um, can see um, functionally in older individuals. So there's an overall increase in the heart size. This is called cardiomegaly. Um, particularly, particularly the left ventricle, as we've pointed out. There's an increase in the accumulation of elastic and fibrous tissue, as well as collagen and fat, especially around the SA nodal region. This, together with the loss of SA nodal cells, results in a decrease in the heart weight and heart rhythm. There's the calcification and the stiffening of the cardiac skeleton, which are really the fibroskeletal structures that kind of frame out the heart and the chambers. And as that gets stiffer, it's harder for the heart to actually um, relax adequately and pump adequately together with the, um, the decrease in the volume of the chamber. This results in a less efficient pump overall. There's also a slowed conduction velocity through the heart. Um, we also see things like hypertension, um, coronary artery disease, the deposition of that lipofusin pigment we talked about earlier. And um, this is usually a part of our cardiovascular disease, but there's just worse prognosis for older individuals when we see these types of changes to the heart. So that is to say that um, there's a higher risk, fa risk factor for elderly individuals to experience heart disease because of these underlying changes that are associated with aging to begin with. And so on this slide, I wanted to point out the 
kind of fibrosis and calcification of the cardiac skeleton that I talked about earlier. So this is the cardiac skeleton, which is kind of the um, fibroskeletal framework of the heart. And as we can see here on a histological representation at the bottom, there's this fibrosis, this fibrous um, deposition, collagen deposition. All of these fibers just kind of create this stiff fibrotic um, skeleton, which is what results in that decreased efficiency of the heart to kind of move the way it did, the way it once worked, the way it once did. Um, as a part of its function as a pump. And so when you see this fibrosis, the heart becomes um, less adequate at filling and at pumping and less adequate as a pump overall. Now, here are some of the signs and symptoms that an elderly patient might present with that would indicate some type of cardiovascular dysfunction. So there's usually chest pain, sometimes referred to as angina. Um, because of the um, coronary artery disease or the coronary artery narrowing, um, we sometimes see dyspnea, which is that shortness of breath or labored breathing or just general fatigue um, because of the inadequate oxygenation to tissues. We uh, also see gastrointestinal symptoms, so sometimes heartburn or chest burn because of the sensation on fibers that are associated in that region with the heart. We may even see cognitive um, dysfunction, we may see confusion, dizziness, fainting as a part of the baroreceptor dysfunction. And then um, as a part of the, this, the dysfunction that's seen with heart rate and rhythm, we can see tachycardia, which is a really fast heart rate, or bradycardia, which is a really slow heart rate. And these two symptoms are also associated with general cardiac arrhythmias, which are any types of weight and rhythm dysfunction that's associated with the heart. Um, and then lastly here, as we talked about earlier, we can see strokes because of the vascular changes that are appreciated in some of the smaller vessels of the, of the brain. So vessels of the, uh, um, the circle of Willis, such as the carotids and the basilar artery, where we sometimes see aneurysms because of the weakening of the vessel wall um, and the, um, the changes that we talked about to the vasculature, as well as the higher blood pressures. And so here are some general warning signs. So again, signs and symptoms that we may see in a younger individual and may not be as alarming, but when we see these signs and symptoms in older individuals, so above the age of 65, we're definitely worried about possibly cardiovascular disease. So shortness of breath in general, um, swelling of the legs of any kind, swelling of the face as well, um, chest pain or chest discomfort or um, cardiac um, what, what sometimes people refer to as just heartburn. We definitely want to take that as um, a possible sign of cardiovascular dysfunction. General fatigue or just being tired or not, um, not having uh, energy, but also actual signs and symptoms of fatigue. So for example, cyanosis, cyanosis is blowing of the nails, blowing of the lips and mucous membranes, which are also more obvious signs that there could be fatigue. Um, we may even see a uh, change in exercise tolerance, um, which is another um, giveaway about fatigue, um, heart palpitations or heart sensations, such as a rapid, really fast heartbeat, or just the sensation of your heart beating, which we shouldn't normally feel. Um, and then there's confusion and dizziness, which are more associated with possible stroke or, um, or vascular injury to the brain. So these are some signs and symptoms that, again, are very alarming and are telltale about cardiovascular involvement, particularly things that we are um, looking out for and responsive to when we see them in older individuals. Now, what can we do about aging and the heart? How can we promote healthy heart aging? So the science shows that there are a couple of things that are um, more likely to result in better heart health with age and decrease some of these changes that are seen um, with age to the heart and the vasculature. So definitely number one is gonna be an active lifestyle. So because the heart is a pump, and its uh, job is to pump blood around to the tissues, as we decrease in our ability to use that pump effectively, then it decreases in its efficiency, right? So the less you use it, the less it efficiently it works kind of thing. So 
keeping physical activity up, um, especially aerobic exercises, aerobic activity. Um, it's also gonna help in just overall good health. So weight control, blood pressure control. Um, and so while the heart has many benefits to gain from a active lifestyle and physical activity, this is also um, gonna be more beneficial on a, on a larger scale. So th things like general well-being, um, mental clarity, and all the other benefits that come along with exercise and physical activity. Also, we wanna think about things like diet. So some of those inflammatory um, compounds and substances in our diet, like trans fats, saturated fats, salt, refined sugars. These are the things that create this really inflammatory uh, environment in our body and increase the plaque formation and the hardening and the narrowing of our vessels, which is called atherosclerosis. Um, we also talk about some of the other lifestyle things like smoking and drinking um, and how they can also contribute to that inflammatory environment and the plaque formation. So avoiding those types of lifestyle risk factors is another important uh, modification that can avert some of those cardiovascular um, changes. And then the final one here is to control chronic disease. So things like diabetes, hypertension, um, cholesterol, we want to control some of those disease processes in order to minimize the damage to the heart, especially blood pressure. High blood pressure is one of the most, um, one of the most injurious uh, events that can happen to the heart muscle, to the vessel wall. Just having sustained chronic high pressures damages vessel walls, makes the heart work harder, and just speeds up the weight of aging on the cardiovascular system. So now that we've kind of talked about some of the changes here and this week, you're going to um, post a voice or video contribution and kind of explain from your point of view, again, drawing on your experiences, your research or what articles you've come up on, why is cardiovascular dysfunction a good predictor of mortality in aging populations? And what types of cardiovascular change do you think are associated with being the most detrimental to overall health? 